in the roll here. <coughs> so I thought a good thing to do, uh, having talked about the uh, inertial and kinematic loading, uh, to show you uh, how well uh, some of the theories we have learned this morning about the flexibility factor and so on actually work. Uh, a large body of data, uh, oh, sorry, research exists mostly by the Greeks trying to make uh, complicated equations. I'll show you some of the equations in a second. Uh, driven by George Gizitas and a lot of his co workers uh, who are professors in their own right now, and also the other Greeks and Italians. They're all basically. Uh, identify the same groups we identified this morning and then keep changing the maths and uh, each publish a paper, which is fine. But there's no, nobody knows if one of those expressions is better than the others or what, you know, are they even close? So when Tejesh Kumar showed up from India, I said, oh, we've done quite a lot. Of, he said, Oh, uh, I want to work on pines. Uh, I said, good. And then he said, how about pines in like survival soils? I said, well, we've done quite a lot of work on that already. We have four or five PhDs. Uh, why don't we look at something different? Why don't we look at pines in soft soils? And this is quite a genuine problem. So. If you think about it, actually, it's more important than piles and sands. Because if you have really soft clay, that's when you need the pile foundation from a structure's point of view to carry the load to something uh, good and more, uh, which can withstand bigger loads below. That's the whole point of a pile foundation. So it's more often than not, you will, you're in this situation where you've got soft soil, you've got a building, and you want to carry that load down here. <laughs> but we also know that the soft soils actually amplify accelerations. Now, you don't need any theory for this. You take a ball of jelly and you wobble it at the base. Of course, the top is going to do quite a lot. You know, it's very simple. So we know the soils do the same thing. But what of course matters in these problems is how big is the amplitude and the frequency of the motion which the soft soils can transmit. And we are not the first ones to have identified. Lots of uh, buildings in Mexico City have collapsed <laughs> because what they call of the, the ball effect or the basin effect. So if you look at this traces from 1988 earthquake in Mexico City, Ricardo Dopri and his work co-workers basically saw that on the rock side, so the Mexico City is somewhere here. So on the west side is where the mountains are. That's where all the faults are. So the fault ruptured here, uh, somewhere there, and a station close to this, uh, uh, called the UDAM, uh, measured 0.04 G. As I said, uh, yeah, like with Ahmedabad, nothing should have happened. 0.04 G is so small. However, here there was a problem. The problem was that if you are here at this site, barely 20, 25 kilometers, they recorded an acceleration of 0.1 G. Now we are getting serious. And they had this whole bowl of soft clay, and one of the recordings was nearly 0.2 G. And the buildings uh, which fell off are all sitting in this shaded area. So clearly, soft soils pose problems, especially deep deposits like that. And people also looked at how the earthquake spectral change, the response spectral change. This is just the spectral acceleration with the uh, <coughs> uh, time period. And if you are here, the spectrum looks like this. 
if you're here, the spectrum looks like that. If you're here, again, it flattens out. So it seems there is a particular depth of soil layer which amplifies the most, as you can see from the plus bone sector, the spectrum. So these things are well known. <laughs> so if we come back to the classification again, typically we think of piles as a single pile or five groups. So let's consider four. And <coughs> the various options you have, uh, you have a pile group or a pile which are purely <coughs> in the soft soil, and therefore you can call them either floating piles or friction piles, whatever word you fancy and you have other sets which carry <coughs> bigger loads which go all the way to the soft soil and embed themselves into some stiff <coughs> either rock or dense sand or, <coughs> or stiff clay so again they can be single pile or pile group <coughs> now clearly there's a phd to be had by comparing any and these two, these two, again, across the board. So you can make a lot of comparisons, provided you can get some reliable information. And this, again, is why I went through all of yesterday talking about the Kenji. So when Tanya started, he started by first problem is everybody before him worked on sands. So he had to work out a way of creating soft soil. And we were looking for very soft soils. <coughs> so, he, this is a laminar box, and this is a view at the end of this interview where you can see the clay and the piles inside go so like a single pile and a one by three pile groups. <laughs> and the usual array of instruments. So, we decided to put <coughs> three different earthquakes of this, a, a, quite a weak one, 0 0.07G, 0.1G, and 0.2G. So when you start, you start simple. So I said, start with uh, friction piles only. So he had, all this is just soft clay. There are a few things we do. One is, we have this device here, which can create small impulses. These impulses can travel upwards, which means <laughs> you can pick them up on the accelerometers and get a shear wave velocity measurement directly. So the stiffness of the soil is measured using this device called air hammer. What about strength? We also have devices to push into the clay in flight. Of course, anything I say must happen when the thing is rotating around, which can push in either a, a cone or a T bar while the thing is good. I'll come to that in a minute. <coughs> so, this is the air hammer. Typically, you bury it at the base of the uh, model. And we have these accelerometers which uh, pick up the travel of these waves. You can see, as I go higher up, it's taking time for the wave to arrive. So I know the arrival times. And I know the distance from between those two, so I can work out shear wave velocity. So if you do that and plot, you basically the, the shear wave velocity starting from something like 70 meters per second going up to 85 or something like that. <coughs> so that is the stiffness. If I know shear wave velocity, I don't know why it is other part of that, but Vs is square root of G over rho. So G is rho V squared. So if I know the saturated unit weight, I can work out my G. So instead of plotting shear wave mode uh, with the depth, I can plot shear modulus variation with the depth. <coughs> the other thing we do is to have a device like this, 
and you push that device into the clay. It's basically like a penetrometer. For a penetrometer, see, a cone penetrometer, but if I have a cone penetrometer uh, in soft clay, you don't get much resistance. So it's very, uh, it falls within the noise of what we can measure. So another way we use this is called, uh, again, developed by Mark Randall, is called the Kiva. It's very uh, simple. You have a rod and another rod like that, that is 90 degrees to this. As seen there on the top. And you push this into the clay. And what happens is the clay has to flow around like that. as you are going deeper, and that flow will create a, so we'll measure the, the load. We have a load set here to measure the load, okay? <coughs> so all you need is just a T-bar factor, uh, it's called very originally N T-bar. And we know for clays, this is about 10.5, the uh, strength of the top, maybe 2 kp or something. And as you go deeper, see these are in meters, but getting up to about 6 or 7 kp. So it's very, very soft clay. But you've got this linear increase, it's there, more or less. <coughs> and you do this after the test as well, and perform. you've got, uh, you still maintain the same strength. There's no sort of significant softness. So we measure the strength and stiffness in flat. So you can't be uh, more sure of the properties of the soil if you want it to. And this, this is the absolute best you can get. Okay. And then we apply in those days with uh, uh, my SAM actuator I showed you yesterday. It does the sinusoidal motions. So the first one is a very weak one. We apply the acceleration to base. You see it's all going up. And if you see the peaks, they're getting bigger as I go to the top. So there is some amplification. You can also follow the same on the Fourier transforms and see that more or less what's happening. So the base frequency is there. And the higher harmonics are getting bigger as well as you go through the clip. <coughs> this is what he wants to point out. Now let's see what happens. You apply a bigger clay. Same clay, same instruments, same test. Yeah, we are applying a bigger earthquake. This earthquake I picked here is nearly 0.2G. 0.2G. You can see even by naked eye that if we, if that's the base acceleration, by the time I came to the top, it has reduced. It's not going bigger, it's gone smaller. Now, you can also look at what happened to the other frequencies. The base frequency is reducing, and also the higher frequencies are dying down. <laughs> this is interesting. If you apply a small earthquake, the soil does one thing. If you apply a bigger earthquake, it does exactly the opposite. <laughs> and because we've got so much instrumentation, you can actually work out the, the shear stress on any plane you like. Here, he shows the calculation for uh, our depth of uh, about at the mid depth of the uh, soil layer. But you can do this calculation wherever you have instruments. And we saw if you calculate the shear stress for this particular earthquake at mid depth, uh, about 8.2 meters below, you are getting a shear stress of nearly 6 kPa. Yeah? 
So I do the density is basically this for let's say I got the block. So that's my Z. And if I work out mass times acceleration this way, and that's imagine that's a meter wide. <laughs> so what's the shear stress along here? This is that cost wants to go there and this block is saying. So as I increase the depth Z, I can keep work out shear stress of any horizontal layer I want. Because I know the acceleration response. So I know basically A. <coughs> we can also then compare this with the strength. Because we measured this strength by pushing the T bar in. So if I go one step back. I can see at what depth am I getting the 6 kPa. So the 6 kPa is only at 7 meters. Now, so what this whole thing is telling us is if my earthquake demands more than 6 kPa, the soil can't do it because it has only strength of 6 kPa. So up to that depth, I can carry the acceleration. Above that, I can't carry the acceleration anymore. The soil is too weak. Yeah, so it just shears off. Which means as I go above 7 meter, that 7 meter depth, it should attenuate because it can't carry the acceleration. Does that make sense to you? Yeah? Below that, it will be fine, as you can see here. <laughs> so, so by measuring things carefully, we can link up the behavior of the soft soil directly to the measurements, and it should all fit together. Yeah? And it does, beautifully. Now, let me go and this, suppose you are a young engineer, and you're trying to solve this problem, you Google around, and you find there's a program called uh, Shake, done by Berkeley Group some 50, uh, 20 years ago. And they have Shake 70, Shake 80, Shake 91. Now you can buy, I'm sure, Shake 2015 or something. It's, it's not expensive to buy, but what that program does is basically solves the same equation as that, but it does not understand that soil can actually yield. It thinks it's all linear elastic springs. So if you solve the same problem with shake, or even for that matter, deep soil, you predict for small earthquakes, it will amplify. For bigger earthquakes, you will amplify even more. It's the stronger you shake it, the more, it's an elastic system of what the hell does it do? It just predicts more input, more output. Yeah? Whereas, a little bit of common sense and a bit of thinking about the problem will tell you, if you have big earthquakes on very weak soil, there's no way the soil can carry this big accelerations to the top. So that's just to do with the soil and the strength of the soil. Are you convinced that this our soil is doing the right thing? Yeah? So we've measured everything properly. Now let's throw in. <coughs> so now we can identify along the depth there where my shearing zone is. So that's where my, as I pointed out earlier, that's when my strength is. Uh, falls below. So as I'm traveling upwards, once I come about here, it's less than 6 kPa, therefore it has to bear. Yeah, so the soil basically shears in that zone. <coughs> well, we're not interested just in the soil part of it.
we want to go and stick needles at other people. So I called Hush, I said, God, give me a free copy of Deep Soil. You just have to read it so you can get it. And I said, ah, let me run this. If I ran this analysis with motion one, which is a small earthquake, the prediction between the shake and my centrifuge test are pretty close. If I do the same for my big earthquake, the black line behind, which is dropping, is the centrifuge result, yeah, and the blue line is the deep soil analysis. So you can see straight away, there's no way this is knowing uh, that it should not carry that big shear source. So we can have fun and games with that. <coughs> Sorry. Ah, I didn't explain this. This one you're saying. Uh, the land, the, the deep soil, is a little bit better written. That's why he gave me the code. He is not a hush hush. Is not idiot. You know, otherwise, I'll destroy his reputation, and he has nothing to fall back on. One of the options in his uh, analysis is that you can do non-linear analysis and give a yield curve. So he said, we set the yield exactly as 6 kPa, and then it predicts properly. So that's why the top rate is done with a non-linear analysis and with the right yield limit, and then it works. <coughs> yeah? Sir, if that was done with the proper yield in linear addition, why the second yield there is not the same? This one is, okay, that's a different analysis. That's with nonlinear uh, yielding in the soil. This is the uh, elastic analysis. In shake, you don't have this option of running with nonlinear. It's all just elastic. <laughs> By the way, ninety percent of Californian engineers still follow shake. They still do analysis investigation with site response analysis with shake. So at least with this published, they're the, uh, they'll buy deep soil. Actually, if you want to write that program, you can write it in about half an hour in MATLAB. It's not hard. You don't need to buy anything. Even. <coughs> okay. So that's the first point. Coming back to the pile foundations, let's see what the piles do. <coughs> let's worry about just the single pile. Small earthquake, oh, sorry, uh, so small earthquake and large earthquake, my apologies. Uh, for the small earthquake, you can see that uh, the single pile is doing that, pile group is doing that. We have two pile groups, different pile spaces, forget that for now. And this is the clay. So you can see when I have a small earthquake accelerations, all of them amplify. In fact, the, ampl the piles amplify more than the soil. <coughs> and when I have a larger earthquake on this side, the clay has completely died, as we have seen before, because it can't carry the acceleration. But the pile groups are still quite big. And they are carrying more acceleration. Why is this? In fact, there is a, a subtle difference. One of them is a bit smaller, the others are bigger. Yeah, on the top and bottom. That one and that one are bigger, this one is smaller. Yeah? Let me explain why. <coughs> now, let me draw the lines as well. The reason for this is if I have let's think of the clay layer, and what we are saying is at some depth, like eight meters, is the failure surface.
<laughs> yeah. If my file goes all the way to here, I'm doing something bad for the file answer. What I'm saying is, you go to the stiffer part of the soil, and if I shake this, the accelerations can nicely go through the pipe. If I can stop my file, sorry, that's a straight line. I, I'm not able to show it very well. There. That, then the acceleration this will see will be smaller than this one. Because it's above the failure plane. So it depends on where the tip of the file actually ends. And that's what these things are showing. Some files have gone below, some files have gone up, and that's why they give a bigger or smaller response. So it's quite cool stuff if you can know and follow closely what's going on. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, the top one is single file. Yes, sir. I will talk about. I'm asking about the second one. This one. That's file group one. And this is file group two. Yeah, these are actually the ones which stop here. Uh, it's like that. So that is file group two. That's why you are getting smaller acceleration. Yes. Yeah, that's why they we are plotting what the head is doing, right? So the head is responding less compared to all the other ones. <coughs> By the way, I hope you realize when we say something yields or fails. That means it's like applying a threshold. You will still carry that six kPa worth of acceleration through. It's just it can't be any more than six kPa, right? So you understand the concept of threshold acceleration or yield acceleration. It's basically that. Okay. Also, I mean, there's so much stuff in here. I can talk about just one figure for an hour. Cycle by cycle, you can see they're getting smaller and smaller. Why? This is because if you cycle clay, it tends to soften. Okay? I haven't even talked about that aspect. So, <laughs> we are so far ahead of the game already by knowing that the first cycle, you get big response for all the other cycles. Uh, the, the, you can actually back calculate uh, the cyclic softening of clay which you may or may not see in your cyclic reaction test. Some people do, some people don't. It depends on how good your sample is. But here is the proof. <coughs> so we're all completely happy with that, yeah? Good. Now let's go to the other case. Where we are looking at, let's just focus on one pipe for now. But here, like a proper pipe, it goes through soft clay and into tensile. This is the most common thing you will come across. I'll remove the complexity of file group. We'll talk about that another time. <coughs> so similar arrangement uh, of instrumentation, the T-bar, air hammer, and so on. So I don't need to repeat all that. Just to show you, we are now getting slightly stronger clay. It's about 15 kPa. Uh, this is a bit like your Kochi offshore mush. <coughs> and that goes up to 
Seven meters and even deeper. Now, <coughs> the sand, the sand layer actually is below this level. Okay? And we are pushing the T-bar in. And of course, uh, we cannot push the our little flimsy little T-bar into the sand. We'll break it. So we don't push it beyond seven meters because we know the interface is at eight. So this data stops here because we don't dare push it any deeper. <coughs> However, we have these air hammer things <coughs> measuring the stiffness. So this is the stiffness we got in the sand, and that is the stiffness we are getting in the clay. Now, Tejesh has worked out how to convert shear wave velocity into uh, shear modulus and brought the shear modulus properly there. So it's up to something like 25 30 megapascals of stiffness in clay and about 150 200 megapascals in sand, which are reasonable numbers. There is other data out there to compare. <coughs> These tests were done at 60 G using the unit. <coughs> One of the things you can do if you want to look at response is to apply a sine sweep. So we can sweep through a range of frequencies. So at the bottom here, <coughs> is the input portion. Okay. So you start low frequency and increase the frequency as you go along. So you get more and more cycles to a bit back. And you observe what your file does on the top. You don't want to apply big amplitude sine waves because that, you know, will kill your uh, clay. So you want to make it small. <coughs> Clearly, you can see that response is much bigger than this one. So compared to the input, it amplifies. And it's also amplifying at a particular time, more towards here, less here. <coughs> and so that is just the uh, With the uh, oh sorry, I completely skipped the time there. I forgot to mention one important detail. Sorry, that is to do with the what we are using for the file cap. So we do two tests with the clay. One is go to file and we make the top with first phase. So this is like plastic. Yeah? It has almost no weight. So that is flight, flight one. We then do another flight Then we replace this with brass. As you know, brass is quite heavy. <laughs> so the idea is that flight one will capture just the file with no mass. So what interaction should I pick up? Going back to the morning? Thank you. Make me feel so happy. Kinematic. Simple action. And this one, when I have brass on the top, instead of first perspex will give me. Thank you. You are quite good at this. 
a lot of people would have said that yeah now we are in business because I know what kinematic is I know in, uh, inertia and kinematic which means I can work out what the inertia alone is yeah so this was quite a clever idea of having perspex and brass. <coughs> now this graph makes more sense. So this is for flight one and that's for flight two. Red is the uh, clay and blue is the pipe. Both are single pipe. Okay, we're only concentrating on single pipe. Clearly, when I have just the <coughs> kinematic interaction, the pile and the soil are doing pretty much the same, which is what you should expect, right? Because there's nothing else for the pile to do. It just follows whatever the soil asks it to do. However, plonk this brass on the top in the second flight, red is what the soil uh, is doing at the top level, and blue has gone crazy. <laughs> because when I sweep these frequencies, obviously it can hit its natural frequency at some point, and therefore it responds like big uh, peak. So that is where its natural frequency should be. And that's why we do the sine sweep, so that we can identify where the peak occurs. So I can do now the FFT, fast Fourier transform of that. You can see red and blue, clay and pipe do exactly the same. Then I have only kinematic. Then I have kinematic and inertial, <laughs> obviously in this case dominated by the inertial mass. <laughs> the red shows that. Uh, peak somewhere here, which is the natural frequency of the clay, and the blue, which is a single pile, has a peak somewhere here, which is about 0 0.6, 0 0.7. Okay? So, it is quite cool that we can identify uh, 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 um, the natural frequencies, and they're so well separated as well. Now, because we got a single pipe, <coughs> we can also put strain gauges along the pipe. And therefore, uh, you're aware of strain gauges, right? You can make them measure bending. So if you have two of them on either side, you can make it a direct measurement of bending, uh, bending moment. So we calibrate them, you know how much voltage means how much, how many Newton meters. So here, what is being shown is the simple base excitation, which is about quite small, 0 0.04 G. And the measurement of the bending moment with the depth at a given instant. Yeah. So you can see <coughs> in the blue is the kinematic and the red is the kinematic plus the inertia bending moment directly measured and expressed at prototype scale, kilonewton meters, using your scaling law. You can own it now, you derived it yesterday, right? When I apply a bigger earthquake, the kinematic hardly changes because the soil is soil, if anything it has gone down. Inertial, of course big earthquake, big brass sitting on the top, means it has now gone up to nearly 1,000 kilonewton meters. That's 10 tons in old currency, 10 ton meters. That's big bending moment by any book. <coughs> so, it's cool that we can get bending moments with uh, for different cases and see how they change with the depth as well. So, if you are half good with your structural analysis, you should be able to work out the shear forces from this because you know shear forces are 
how are they related to bending moving? Thank you. <laughs> I like this. Uh, so you should be able to work out the shear force because you can work out the slope of the curve. <laughs> Yeah. How come there is no sudden change in bending moment at the interface of soft plane? Ah, this is uh, interesting. Basically, what we are saying is it's being dominated by the brass mass in the top. So the reason it's trying to get down is where it is getting to the interface. Uh, and uh, it's not, a lot of people say this is all to do with the uh, you get peak bending moment at the interface. It actually, uh, hopefully our geotechnic paper will come out soon and you will see that it will show that it's dependent on the relative stiffness between the, the two layers as well. Okay. <clears throat> now, we can use the same bending moment data and let's plot because, I mean, in theory, I could plot one of those at every instant of the earthquake, right? So as the earthquake is happening, the pile is doing that, and the bending moment is, it's actually, you can play it like a movie. Now, that playing of movie may be good to visualize, but what's more useful for an engineer is if you plot the maximum bending moment on low. <coughs> now, this is quite revealing for First of these, so the blue is our flight one, yeah, which is just the kinematic. So you can see it's pretty symmetrical on either side. For we are plotting maximum of pluses and maximum of minuses. The fact that it is symmetric shows our pile is well gauged more than anything else. Uh, and when I added the brass mass for the second flight we got much bigger, almost 350 or uh, 500 uh, as peaks. And that is happening at the interface. Okay, so another way to explain what you're asking earlier is, at that instant, this is what's going on. So because, <laughs> I think Tita shows quite rightly one of the peak points to show this. But, as I said, the phase relationship between kinematic and inertial is important. So when you add all that together and just look at the peaks only, uh, which is what this is, then you pick up the interface. So that's what people miss to say when they say bending moment is always worse at, uh, uh, at the interface but only at that instant. It's not all the time. So you can fail the pile somewhere else if you decided to reduce your cross section or something. But don't do that. Now let's look at this other brighter one here. This is for <coughs> two different cases where we got the Uh, the kinematic and the initial plus kinematic, but for much, much bigger uh, loads, bigger earthquakes. Sorry. And again, you can see it will increase more with the strength of the earthquake. Okay, let's now pause for a second. So, at least you should trust me now that we can measure the inertial and kinematic bending, moment, bending moments with confidence in different pile cases. I mean, in the, I only showed you single pile, but we can do the same for pile cases. <laughs> now, let's go back and see what we did in the morning. In the morning, I showed you one equation, the flexibility uh, factor matter. <laughs> if you go back to the lecture, <coughs> here, you can pull out all kinds of <laughs> equations. I'm just going to briefly talk about these. The first people 
are Dobrian uh, horror, from horror, uh, one RPI guy and one from Cotman. And they published this paper in 1983, basically looking at of the file as a <coughs> Winkler beam. Okay, with the horizontal spaces. <coughs> what are the things they identified? They thought the flexural rigidity of the file is important. Everybody knows that. So they got that up there. I don't know if you can see them or not, but don't worry. And they also thought the shear modulus of the soil is important. And the ratio of the shear modulus between the two layers is important. So they have proposed a set of equations. This was way back in 83. And then Gazette has gone into an act. And 95, his student Nikolau and these people proposed another set to work out the this is purely we're focusing on kinematic interaction. Forget the inertial part. So these are the expressions in the literature for working out <coughs> the kinematic bending moment for a single point. That's what their maths will allow you to do. Anything more than that, it gets too complicated. <coughs> so they, Greeks, as I said, came up with this. And instead of comparing shear modulus between the two layers, these people are comparing shear wave velocities. I just showed you that basically the same. It's a matter of taste whether you want to call it a ratio of shear modulus or ratio of shear wave velocity. So these guys went for shear wave velocity. And again, all the other things are <coughs> just normalizing input accelerations and so on. <coughs> and then the other thing, Leonakis, turned up and he wrote another set of equations. Again, if you boil it all down, there are a few key things that are saying. One is the strain in the pile or the curvature of the pile is important. Of course, we know that from structural analysis, everybody knows bending moment is curvature, right? So that's one thing in the same. The other one is the ratio of shear modulus, ratio of the uh, the two thicknesses, soft layer and a strong, uh, strong layer thickness are important in all that, which we know. Now, I couldn't put all of this, I was doing this yesterday on one slide. So we got to get more people. These Nikolaou and Gadgetas came back again and had a, a, re a rebuttal of the other word and published another equation. Again, borrowing from the previous word and <laughs> ignoring some of the things other people have said. <coughs> Most recently, this uh, Delora, who are Italian group, publish this set of equations. Now, I'm not going to ask you to go through all these equations, but what you should be aware of are there are a set of equations. And if you have enough uh, mathematical skills, I'm sure you can make up another set of equations like this and publish all of the things. I won't be surprised. But it's of absolutely no value. Why? Because if you look at here, the three things they're talking about, Young's moduli of the pile, they're happy with that, and then they got Young's modulus of the two layers. And I said to you earlier, that does not make any sense. What is Young's modulus? And, okay, shear modulus, I believe, a bit more, G1, G2 for the two layers, and cross-sectional area, maximum bending moment, that's what we want. The shear wave velocities, they're all okay. The rest of the factors we can believe. There's also this snuck in this RD, which is the same factor which C. Dendritus a long time ago uh, suggested to allow for uh, increase in stress with depth. So we are even back to the them. So copy other people's equations and put them in. So this is a big list of all the uh, variables in those equations which you can look up in calculation. And let's not waste time on this. <laughs> we decided for fun to plot these things because we got the data and see how they work. <coughs> That's what we did. So let's do the first one first. Small earthquake. And we're only doing kinematic. As I said, inertia is not 
Uh, we are not taking that into consideration. If I show this to you, you'll say, oh. so this is all the experimental measurements. Yeah. And these are the calculated values. You can only calculate the maximum uh, kinematic bending moment with those equations. It does not going to tell you how the distribution is. Okay. They're just analytical solutions. You have to use them. So at least at this point, where we are getting maximum bending moment, that should be consistent. <coughs> Will you be happy? I mean, if my measurement is saying that it's 90, these are maybe from 50 to 90. Right? It's not a big deal. Okay? That's the best they can do. Now, you apply the same equations for a larger earthquake. The fourth earthquake in the series was big, for a large 2GO, 125G. So the peak for us now is at about 450, uh, 460 kilonewton meters. Yeah? Look at the predictions. So, the worst one is this guy. Nikolau, triangle is Globry, diamond is Milanakis, and the star, this guy is coming a little bit closer, but it's quite far away. Yeah? So we've done all the maps. We have done uh, in the morning, we've done all this, uh, gone through these expressions, identified what is right, right? But here's the proof of the pudding. So what it's telling is that if you have a small earthquake, these expressions are okay to make a go at estimating kinematic bending uh, moments. But if you have a really proper sized earthquake, 0.2G is not even that big. Yeah? If you have even 0.2G uh, earthquake, they're hopeless. They're by factor of two. So, where do you think we are with this? And that's why this whole thing has been worthwhile doing. So you get to, you put in all the effort at the front. You know, poor Teja spent all at night after night trying to look out for the clay when it's consolidating. You never knew what you're going to get at the time. But when it comes out, you can go and poke at people like Gajitas. Yeah. You know, in, in Greece, they think there is Alexander the Great and then John Gajitas. So there's nobody in between. So he's very big. And he's quite candid. When I showed this to him in Rome, he was very happy. He said, yeah, sure, we, uh, we did that just maths. Based on maths, it's a pity someone does not understand mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully that has made the point I wanted to make. You need to <coughs> understand what the real mechanics is before you can make expressions like that. It could be, hopefully I'm hoping that Tejas can fix this quite easily if he knows what the right amount of soil pressure is generated on the pipe while it is shaking. Now, that's a story for another time. I don't want to cheat him out of his PhD, let him do the thinking. Uh, <coughs> one person who complained a lot about this was this guy, uh, uh, Rafael Dilora. Part of the reason he was complaining is he knows us very well and he uses our centrifuge facility for some of his testing. He said, if you get published this, everybody is going to laugh at us. And he said, not really, this is part of the research we have. Then he said, let's try and improve this a bit. So, in Taking back you to these expressions here, there's nothing in these expressions which tell you that the shear modulus you use, this G1 and G2, for the layers, <coughs> must be corrected for the shear strength. Because how would you do that? In reality, you can't. So you basically estimate your shear velocity, clock in the number, which means you'll only ever going to use the maximum shear modulus. In any case, they're saying, the ratio of these two is important. So they, nobody corrects them for shim uh, strength. 
<laughs> but our Raphael wanted to do that, and we are actually working on that. If I have time, I'll show that to you tomorrow. If you apply the correction for those equations based on soil <coughs> nonlinearity, they will they do better. Some do better, but none do as well as they should. Uh, that's why I'm not uh, included in, in this presentation. But even with allowing for the nonlinearity, they're not good. <coughs> and I've shown you for just small earthquake and big earthquake, but we have other earthquakes in between. If I plot my uh, peak acceleration along the uh, x-axis at the peak kinematic learning moment on the y-axis, now we can see the same information we saw for all the earthquakes. So what we are seeing as a trend is this Black dots are the centrifuge data. So with the largest earthquake we fired was about 0.32 or something. So not uh, the bit I showed you was the difference of somewhere here, wasn't it? Uh, perhaps no, this one, 0.182 or something I showed earlier. <laughs> so the difference gets bigger and bigger the larger the earthquakes are. So maybe if you have a tiny little earthquake. Then at this location, for 0.07 G or something, the comparison is maybe reasonable if you're being generous. Certainly, by the time you've got to 1.17 G or higher, the differences are getting factors of two or two and a half. Okay? So these are all the available methods at the moment in the literature. There's no new, nothing newer than this. In fact, there's one newer thing they presented in Rome, which we plotted on this spot and showed them, and that's even worse than any of this. So, Gadgetus is going backwards. So, I'd like to make a few summary points here. <coughs> so, hopefully, you're now quite comfort comfortable with the terms inertial and kinematic uh, loading on points. Surely, that, that's the minimum, right? Really, uh, we are starting to see how core these theoretical uh, or semi critical estimates are, and uh, with some solid proof. Uh, there are ways you can improve them. Uh, for example, uh, we did think about, you know, the flexibility factor has the frequency ratio term in it. Well, that's going to make a difference. And then we quickly realized, actually, if these files are resonating, the uh, solutions get worse. So in fact, we need to compensate for that even more, uh, more to come on along those lines. But the bottom line is, it's one thing to think about files under earthquake learning and do some basic uh, things based on literature. But it's quite a different theory on what actually is going on. And if you want to find what actually is going on, nothing like some experiments and exercising the brain. It's not, uh, as I keep telling everybody I meet, it's not about the facility. It's about what you're thinking. There are 85 other centipede centers in the world. None of them did this. Why? It's how you think. If you look at the problem, you need to nail it down into component parts and then I address each one of them. And that can be done in any which way, whether it's numerical, centrifuge, what is it, whatever. Okay? And that's it. Okay. What are we doing now? You want to set them some work? Have a break. Have a good care. I'm always happy to answer questions. That, that goes without saying. I'm not running any lab, so feel free to ask. So how do you measure the 
How do you measure the shear wave velocity? Because we are sending to pulses. This one. So what this bit at the base, the air hammer device, is basically a tube. So you have like a tube and a ball in it. And if I apply air pressure here, it runs and hits the sand. And that makes the whole thing slide, so that creates a shear wave. And that shear wave propagates all the way to the top as we are floating. So the accelerometers are picking up the, uh, the shear wave acceleration. And all we really need is the arrival time. So if I know the arrival time, because I know the distance between them, I can work out shear wave. So it's like measuring, because these are quite small pulses, it's like measuring uh, G naught or G max. No. We have uh, accelerometers having in uh, three dimensional accelerometers. Yep. The, uh, the way you are aiming uh, in different directions, the direction of the wave, you know, the shear wave, how do we identify that it is shear wave itself? Oh, in this case, it can't do anything else. Uh, in this case, you guys can hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I thought so. Basically, you don't need uh, all this can do is to slide. Yeah? So if it slides, it creates the shear stress along here. That's why we stuck some sand on it. So it couples with the soil and shear. So it shears one way and then the other. And you know the time difference between the two as well. So <coughs> there's no question, there's no other wave being generated. You don't need the 3D action. You can put, but the other two directions don't pick up anything. It's purely vertically propagating. Only shear wave is generated. Yes, only shear wave is being generated. Yeah. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Is it not true that inertia load is dominating till the soil liquefies later? It's only kind of, can be differentiated in that sense? Uh, if it is a liquefied load, sir. But all I showed you now, I deliberately stayed out of liquefaction today for this afternoon. This is all pure software. Kochi problem. Okay? Or, or uh, Bombay or any other board. Yeah, when you get um, sands tend to generate a lot more load when they try to move, even compared to clay. You need really take more conservative dilation to mobilize, apply the same pressure. Because sands can dilate very strongly, especially dense sand. They tend to apply much larger pressure, and also sands are about an order of magnitude stiffer. So they can mobilize more force. <laughs> Anybody else?